Hello, and welcome to those of you who are new to Wondrium and the great courses, and welcome back to all of you who joined me for my original lecture series on the Black Death, which appeared in 2016. Over the next seven lectures, I'm going to share some exciting new information with you about recent scientific discoveries that shed more light on that 14th century pandemic known as the Great Mortality, or the Black Death. And I'm also going to talk about what we've learned about pandemics over the past couple of years as the world has been struggling with COVID-19. When I was taping the last lecture series in late 2015, some fascinating new information about the Black Death was just starting to appear in print in academic journals, scholarly monographs, and scientific papers at precisely the moment we were too far along in the process to include as much of it as we would have liked, although we did get some information in at the 11th hour. Since that time, however, there has been an absolutely exponential growth in terms of the number of discoveries, and indeed evidence, that shows that some of what we thought we knew about the Black Death was completely wrong. Even had the COVID-19 pandemic not erupted in the way it did, it still would have been necessary to do this follow-up series of seven lectures to share new information and correct past misunderstandings. But of course, in the age of COVID, understanding this past pandemic has seemed more relevant and important than ever. I will be the first to say that I thought I could appreciate, not completely, but to a significant degree, I thought I could appreciate how terrifying and horrific it must have been to live through what has long been considered the first wave of the Black Death from approximately 1346 to 1353. In March 2020, I was having a conversation over Zoom, as I imagine many of us were, with some of my friends from college, one of whom is a doctor in the Bay Area, where, as we all know, COVID hit hard in the early days of the pandemic. We started discussing mortality rates, that is, of the people who contract a disease, what percentage of those who are ill will die? At that point in time, COVID mortality rates were hovering around 2%, and hospitals were filled to capacity with people who were very, very sick from the disease. So many of my friends who are doctors were working multiple shifts and quarantining away from family in order to protect their loved ones. On this particular Zoom call, my friend asked me what mortality rates were during the Black Death. What percentage of the people who contracted plague would die from it? Best guess, I said, around 80%. 18%, she said in horror. There's no way. Society would have utterly collapsed. And then I had to tell her that no, I had not said 18%. What I had said was 80%. There was utter silence among the four of us on the Zoom call as my friends absorbed this piece of data. So another friend asked, what percentage of the population actually died? For Europe, I said, estimates are that at least 50% of the population was wiped out. And in that moment, the horror of the Black Death struck me harder than it ever had before. Because while COVID was and is absolutely terrifying, at least in the modern age, we have things like drug therapies and ventilators, and we understand how viruses and bacteria can be transmitted, and we can take steps to try and prevent or reduce transmission. People in the medieval European world had none of that. And as we'll see, Plague was also circulating and devastating populations beyond the borders of Europe during the Middle Ages. And as far as that data I gave my friends on that Zoom call in March 2020, I was probably underestimating. Mortality rates during the Black Death were more likely closer to 82% or 85%, and the overall impact on the population was probably more severe, with something like 60% and in some places as much as 70% of the population wiped out. And while my information was generally correct for Europe, one new piece of information that we're going to explore in depth is this, 
it now seems clear that the Black Death was, in fact, a global pandemic, extending much further into Africa and the Middle East and circulating through much more of Asia than we first believed. Not only that, new research suggests that it was circulating in some places at least a century before the European wave that burned through the population of that continent from 1346 to 1353. One reason that these cases of plague beyond the medieval European world have seemed largely invisible until recently is that there have been very few scholars who have the skills to understand letters, legal documents, and diplomatic reports from this time period from both medieval Western sources and the Mongolian or the Muslim world. I've gotten many emails from people since the first lecture series asking about what was happening to the east of the medieval European world. Were people dying at the same rate as they were further to the west? How were those societies impacted? And usually the answer I give is that since this is beyond my main area of expertise, I'm not really sure. Scholars like me, who were trained to read Latin or Old French, usually don't have facility with primary sources that might have been written in Persian or Arabic or Mongolian. And until recently, scholars from these different traditions haven't usually been sharing resources or pooling their skill sets. In just the last few years, this has started to change. And scholars such as Nuket Varlik, Hannah Barker, and especially Monica Green, whose name you are going to hear a lot in the lectures ahead, have been able to gain access and share information among scholars who work on the same period, but focus on very different communities and languages. Particularly dramatic evidence of this comes from a groundbreaking article titled The Four Black Deaths, written by Professor Monica Green and published in the prestigious academic journal The American Historical Review at the end of 2020. This interchange of information has opened up a whole new world of discovery. We are going to dig more deeply into this article and many other significant contributions made to Black Death Studies by Professor Green and many, many others since we made the previous course in the lectures to come. Additionally, Oli Benedicto, long considered the top plague scholar in the world, in early 2021, released a massively comprehensive new edition of his 2004 book, The Black Death, The Complete History. In this new and enormously expanded edition, Benedicto addresses and includes the new research and discoveries that have occurred since the appearance of the earlier edition of his masterwork. And in case you're wondering what I mean by enormously expanded, Here's the old edition, and you can see how thick it is, which clocks in at a respectable 433 pages. And here is the new edition, which at 1,026 pages is about two and a half times larger. The 2021 edition is so large that twice while traveling, I have had my bag pulled for a check while going through security as the scanners would flag this book because it was so large and didn't really look like a typical book. And of course, I've got some funny looks from the TSA when they opened my bag to find a giant book called The Black Death taking up a huge amount of real estate in my carry-on. In addition to these new discoveries and interpretations of primary source material, what we understand about The Black Death has been greatly advanced by new scientific discoveries concerning the genetic makeup of Yersinia pestis. Innovations in medicine and science have made it possible for us to actually look at the DNA of bodies recovered from plague pits, what scientists call A-DNA or ancient DNA. And we can compare the results in order to determine if what was causing the great mortality throughout the medieval European world was the same disease, and in fact the same strain of the disease, every place we can test for it? And the answer turns out to be yes. Indeed, one very important article that discusses how scientific advances have been used to great result by scholars in the humanities working on plague is entitled, Historians in Lab Coats. So 
Whereas prior to this, scholars primarily relied on eyewitness and first-person accounts from plague-stricken areas with a little bit of scientific and medical knowledge cited to shore up and affirm the major claims, now it is the science that Black Death scholars need to understand first in order to make sense of what the documentary evidence tells us. In many cases, we can now see that we must take many of the claims from primary documents with a grain of salt. Humans then and humans now are prone to hyperbole and exaggeration, so some details that we've relied on as solid evidence need to be looked at a bit more skeptically. But at the same time, the general picture we get from these sources is confirmed. This was, indeed, the world's most devastating plague, and the death, trauma, and suffering endured by those who lived through it still almost exceeds our ability to grasp and imagine it. So between this lecture series and the original one, we have learned so much about plague that a lot of beliefs that we've previously held and which I told you about at great length need to be corrected, amended, or thrown out because they are just plain wrong. So what was it that I and other scholars were wrong about? Well, for one thing, the geographic and temporal origin of the outbreak of the pandemic we now call the Black Death. Earlier, I told you that most scholars have long agreed that climate change in Hubei province, in what is today China, drove an infected rat colony out of their habitat and into contact with humans, probably sometime in the 1330s. And from there, plague moved westward with great rapidity. Nope. As I'll explain at greater length in a future lecture, the wave that entered the medieval European world actually erupted somewhere near the Volga River Basin in the 1330s. And that outbreak, it turns out, was not the major event that produced the second pandemic to begin with. In a later lecture, we'll discuss at length what scientists are calling the Big Bang of Yersinia pestis. And they've pinpointed that this event happened about a century earlier than we thought, somewhere around 1250. And it was not in Hubei province that this occurred, but rather further west, near the Tian Shan Mountains and the Mongolian Steppe. From there, it began to circulate centrifugally, moving both east into China and west into Europe. This is why you see an outbreak in Hubei province in the 1330s and the beginning of the outbreaks in the medieval European world just a decade later. The plague was coming out of a point between Europe and Asia and moving into both territories at roughly the same time. So what else did I accidentally get wrong? Well, the biggest disappointment for many of you may be the story of the siege of Kaffa. You may recall that Mongols supposedly catapulting plague-infected bodies into the city from whence it infected Genoese sailors, who then brought it home to the Italian peninsula. It turns out that that story is super duper wrong. As I'll tell you later, that siege in fact delayed the entry of plague into medieval Europe. Don't worry if this sounds confusing, I will explain at great length. In the earlier lecture series, I also talked about numerous theories that it wasn't just plague circulating in the medieval world. Rather, many scholars have thought that there might have been other diseases circulating simultaneously, which is why the death count was so incredibly high. Anthrax, tuberculosis, typhoid, and the rather fringe theory of particles from space, among others, have all been floated. And at this point, in late 2021, we're pretty sure that it was almost exclusively plague that was responsible for the body count. Here, ancient DNA analysis has helped us put that question to rest, and I'll tell you all about that a little further down the line when I explain that we now understand the primary vector of transmission, the bite of an infected and infective black rat flea. This is still the number one way to contract plague. Another reason to return to this topic now is because plague remains a real threat in the modern world, not least of all because it is considered by the US government to be a disease that could be weaponized. 
Side note here, about three years after I had done all the research and writing and taping for the first lecture series on the Black Death, my father just happened to casually mention that when he was in the Navy and sent to Vietnam, he and the rest of his aircraft carrier crew were all given a vaccination against bubonic plague. I know nothing about how efficacious it might have been, nor does he, but at the moment, there is no plague vaccine in existence. Although the U.S. government is concerned enough about plague and its potential weaponization to have websites dedicated to answering questions about it. The concern about weaponization of a disease also seems particularly apt for discussion during the age of COVID, as we all well remember that when the COVID-19 virus first appeared, many people theorized that the outbreak was due to human error or perhaps even deliberate action, that the virus had escaped or been let loose from a lab. Other theories pointed to contact with certain animals, bats perhaps, that had somehow manifested as a zoonotic episode, leaping from animals to humans. In recent years, we've seen plenty of new and terrifying diseases make this jump, West Nile virus and Zika virus, for example. In our modern globalized world, as climate change brings heretofore unknown diseases into closer proximity with humans, we should be paying close attention to whatever lessons we can draw from COVID, and especially, we should be considering them in light of what we now know about the Black Death. One thing that has become clearer as we compare the after effects of COVID with those of the Black Death is that during and after a pandemic of this scale, society will experience serious upheaval, social, political, economic, religious, and cultural unrest are all things we discussed as regards the outbreak of the Black Death. But as we examine the Black Death in light of COVID, what seems more likely is that the outbreak of a true pandemic simply reveals flaws that we already, on some level, knew were present in our society. And it then exacerbates them to such an extent that it may feel like the whole world has come unmoored from its foundations. And as I'll discuss toward the end of this series of seven lectures, when this happens, we see humans turn in any number of predictable, and very unpredictable directions as they seek some sort of stability and constancy. Now, one thing that I did not unwittingly mislead you about in the first lecture series was the fact that for people who survived the Black Death, after a significant adjustment period, pretty much everyone was better off than they had been before, and humanity underwent several improvements and advancements. We have yet to see what the final outcome of the COVID-19 pandemic will be, but as I write these words in November 2021, we are seeing a surging demand for labor, just like we did in the wake of the plague, and concomitantly, wages rising in an attempt to attract more people back to the workforce. But while there may be some positives we can hope for, the experience of COVID helps drive home for us what the human cost of those advances and improvements really entailed. Starting around 1353, sure, there was plenty of land for the taking. There was increased upward social mobility. The general population was better nourished and better educated. But those well-fed, newly literate, suddenly land-rich people had also experienced an unbelievably traumatic event. Not only that, but it was a trauma that would keep returning every 12 to 15 years or so until 1721. While there is hope that we are reaching the end of the major outbreak of coronavirus, it remains to be seen if we are in the middle of the ride rather than at the end. So now let's get to it and turn our attention to what we now know was the single most important factor in the spread of plague, black rats, and their fleas.